Welcome back. It's good to have you here again for part five of this series, Knowing God. We're going to be talking about the wisdom of God today and what it means for us in our lives. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, I'm going to be coming from all over Scripture today, so um, I don't have really one specific passage I'm coming out. So what I'll do is I'll give you the verses and the references as I use them, and you can write them down or turn to them if you want, but I don't have one specific place I'm going to be at. But let's open up with a word of prayer, then we're going to dive right into the wisdom of God. Father, we love you and we thank you. We're so grateful and thankful for the God that you are. We're so grateful for this beautiful and wonderful day that you have given us out here. And we're just so grateful for all the many blessings. We just want to stop and say today that we love you and thank you for who you are. We thank you for the things that you've done, the things that you're doing. And we thank you for those many great and precious promises you've given us. Father, be with us today and have your hand upon us today as we listen to your word and we listen to you, to who you are and about your wisdom. Father, just show us what your wisdom means for us in our everyday lives so that we can live out the life and give honor and glory to you. We love you and we thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Remind you of what A.W. Tozer says. A.W. Tozer says this, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. He would go on to say, The greatest question before the church is always God himself. Always the most revealing thing about the church is its idea of God. Until we see a vision of God high and lifted up, there will be no woe, there will be no burden, there will be no awe of who he is. The first step down for any man or for any church is taken when we surrender our high view of God. If, there, if I were to sing out the one major issue within any church, it would be this. The church, the body of Christ as a whole, has surrendered its high and, lift, high and lifted up view of who God is. Wrong thoughts about God, what you think about God, and what you believe God thinks about you affects everything in your life. How do we get a right view of God that is high and lifted up? It's very simple. By studying who God is and studying the attributes of God. And that's what we're doing in this series. And an attribute is very simple. And I want to remind you of this. An attribute is something that is true about God. It's who he is. And we need to remember, as we study the attributes of God, that there is not one attribute that is any more important than any other. We may talk about them individually, but you must remember, he is all these attributes all the time. And we began this series talking about the goodness of God in the first week. God is good. That's it. The only way he can act is from his goodness. And who are the objects of his goodness? We are, you and me. By his very nature, he can't help but be good to us. What does this mean? It means that God is so for us. And in session three, we talked about the sovereignty of God. When we talk about the sovereignty of God, this is what we mean. He is in absolute control of time and and eternity. Nothing will come into my life today that he did not allow or decree for my ultimate good. The sovereignty of God tells us that God orchestrates all things for our good according to his purposes and his plans for his glory. Knowing that he is the sovereign God over the universe will allow you to lay your head down at night and not worry about what tomorrow holds. It takes, I love this, it takes all the responsibility out of your hands and places it in the hands of the God that takes full responsibility for your well-being. And last week, we talked about the holiness of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Scripture, every time someone meets with God, when they see that He is holy, something happens. When people see that He is holy, here's what you get. We're not. Every time in Scripture, when someone encounters the holiness of God, they're on their face. They are undone. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, he saw the holiness of God. And his response to God's holiness, woe is me. Isaiah was undone. He was in awe before the presence of God. And here's the problem I see today. I don't see many people. I don't see many Christians, pastors, and churches undone before the presence of a holy God. When the people of God don't see him as holy, there will be no difference between the people of the world and the people of God. And that's where we are today. It's hard to tell church people from non-church people anymore. When Isaiah saw the holiness of God, he said, For I am an evil man, and I dwell among evil people. 
Woe is me. I'm in trouble. Isaiah was one of the godliest men of the day. And here, one of the godly men, godliest men of the day is saying, woe is me. That's what God, God's holiness does to us still today. When we see that he is holy, we realize that we're not. We realize our helpless condition as sinners, and it causes a response from us. Either we repent and turn to him, or we continue in our present condition. And here's the great promise. If we will repent and turn to him, he is faithful and just to forgive and heal. 2 Chronicles 7 and 1 John 1 19. See, I want you to follow the progression of what Isaiah did here in Isaiah 6. Isaiah first looked up to see God's holiness. That's the first thing we should do is look up to him. Then he looked, when he saw God's holiness, then Isaiah looked inward and said, Woe is me! A change must happen within me. And next, Isaiah fought, allowed the God of the universe to change him. But then finally, we see the last thing that holy, the holiness of God does to us. The Lord asked the question in Isaiah, asked the question in Isaiah 6. He said, ask, who shall we send? Who And who will go for us? Guess who volunteered? Isaiah. See, God's holiness pushes us out to share his name, his glory, and his righteousness with the world. The holiness of God shows us our need for him. And the holiness of God pushes us out to share his name with the world. So as we come to today in the wisdom of God, we're going to start off a little bit different as we talk about the wisdom of God. I'm going to begin with a hypothetical story, and I want you to think about what you would do in this situation. So listen to the story and think about what you would do. There was a man that worked as a railway switcher. His main job was to make sure that the trains were on the right track to get to their destination. To do this, each day he'd have to make sure that as trains came down the track, the rails were switched to the correct track for the train to continue on. He had a son that was about 10 years old. Often, his son would go with his father down to where he switched the tracks. One day, a train was, a, a train was approaching carrying over 300 people at a high rate of speed. The train simply needed to go straight with no change of the tracks. The man made sure the tracks were set up for the train to just continue straight. Just then, he heard his son running towards him. As his son got closer, the son tripped and fell on the tracks the train was to continue traveling on. His foot was stuck, and he could not get up. <clears throat> his father was still a couple hundred yards away as the train was approaching very quickly. He would never make it in time to help his son get unstuck. He had only two options. One, do nothing and let the train hit and kill his son, but save the over 300 people on board. Or the second option, switch the track, causing the train to derail and possibly kill the more than 300 people on board, but saving his only son. He had only seconds to side. What would you do? a tough question. Some will say, I would do the noble thing and save the greatest number of people by sacrificing their son. I wouldn't switch the tracks. Others will say, forget the more than 300 people. That's my son. I choose him. Can I say this? No matter what decision any of us would make, we don't know the best decision for everyone. What if that son saved by his father became the next terrorist to fly a plane into a building? Or what if one of the people on board the train was the next Billy Graham that would spread the gospel in such a mighty way? We don't know. And we don't know what the best decision would be. The decision would have to come from someone that could see the big picture. Someone that knows every possible outcome and knows the best possible outcome. Someone that knows what is best for all people involved then and in the future. This is what we mean when we say God is all wise. He knows how to produce the best possible results for the most amount of people for the longest possible time by the best possible means. To be all wise, one must know all things, both actual and possible. He must 
That the, the, to be all wise, one must be in control or sovereign over all things and must do what is good for all people. We need someone like an air traffic controller sitting in front of a screen, seeing the whole picture and being able to tell each plane what they need to do next for the good of all flying. Our problem is this. We only see how inconvenient everything is for us in the here and now. But the air traffic controller sees the big picture to produce the best possible results for the most amount of people the, the best way possible. Too often we only see how uncomfortable and inconvenient things are for us, but we fail to see the big picture. And here's a little secret. You and I, we can't see the big picture. We need someone leading and guiding us along the way that already knows the end from the beginning. Someone that knows all things and has the power to make things happen for our good. We need someone all wise. That is the wisdom of God. Thank God the responsibility to see the big picture and do the best and right thing falls on him. And not me, because I would mess everything up. Listen to what A.W. Tozer says about the wisdom of God. He says, to believe actively that our Heavenly Father constantly spreads around us providential circumstances that work for our present good and our everlasting well-being brings to the soul a veritable benediction. That's peace. Most of us go through life praying a little, planning a little, jockeying for position, hoping, but never being quite certain of anything and always secretly afraid that we will miss the way. Listen to what Tozer says about this. This is a tragic waste of truth and never gives rest to the heart. He goes on to say, there is a better way. It is to repudiate our own wisdom and take instead the infinite wisdom of God. Our insistence upon seeing ahead is natural enough, but it is a real hindrance to our spiritual progress. Listen to this. God has charged himself with full responsibility of our eternal happiness and stands ready to take over the management of our lives the moment we turn to him in faith. Wow. God takes full responsibility for our well-being when we surrender to him. That's some really good news. It takes the responsibility off of us and frees us up to pursue him and his plan. I want to make sure we're clear about that, though. You don't get a free pass to sit back and do nothing. Your responsibility is to love him and to love others. When pursuing him, he will lead and guide you along the way of along the path of righteousness from his goodness, from his sovereignty, and from his wisdom. Listen again to what Tozer listen again to how to Tozer and how he defines and describes the wisdom of God. Wisdom among other things is the ability to devise perfect ends and to achieve those ends by the most perfect means. It sees the end from the beginning, so there can be no need to guess. All God's acts are done in perfect wisdom. First, for his own glory, and then for the highest good of the greatest number for the longest time. Not only could his acts not be better done, a better way to do them could not be imagined. Listen to what Paul says about the wisdom of God in Romans 11.33. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And how has God revealed his wisdom to us today? First, through all of creation. Second, th through his providential acts in our lives. Third, through redemption. I want to stop and think about that one for a second. Third, through redemption. He has revealed his wisdom through re redemption. Think about this. All the way from the time of Genesis 3, when sin was actually real in this world, God had a plan. It wasn't a plan B, plan C, plan... It was plan A all along. This was his plan. And moving forward into Genesis 12, when he calls Abraham and calls his, says that his family and his seed is going to be the one that blesses all the world. And then we move on through time and we go through the rest of his family, Abraham, Isaac, oh, Jacob, and Joseph. You, you want to know the definition of a dysfunctional family? Look at the story 
of Jacob and of Joseph from Genesis 37 through Genesis 50. That's a dysfunctional family. And then even through other people throughout history of the world, through um, Ruth and Boaz, Ruth not even being a Jew, um, through Rahab the prostitute, and how his wisdom and his knowledge all the way from the beginning leading up to the time of redemption of Jesus Christ on the cross. He reveals his wisdom to us through his redemption, and he reveals his redemption to us through his son. So, the question becomes, how are we to respond to the wisdom of God? It's a simple answer. We must learn to live wisely. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Walk this way, not as fools, but be wise. Why? Because we walk in a dark and evil world that is against God. Therefore, don't walk unwise, but walk in the ways of the Lord. And how do we walk in the ways of the Lord? How do we walk wisely? Four things I want to give you. First, we must, sh we must show reverence to his ways. Proverbs 1.7 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. If he is good and he is for us, why should we fear the Lord? And that's a great question. Let me, uh, let me, let me answer it for you very simply. My son, he has a healthy dose of fear. He knows not to play in the street. Why? If he does, he may look like the roadkill we see in the middle of the road as we drive down the road. That's a healthy dose of fear. God is saying very simply, if you walk in my ways, you will live life to the fullest, the way I designed it. But fools despise wisdom and instruction, and that is the world we live in today. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I will live my life my way, and that foolish attitude has called division anger, and hatred in the world. And if you don't believe me, turn on the news. Take five minutes and just watch the news. We need to show reverence. We need to show respect to his ways. A healthy dose of fear is a good thing. Second, we must read and understand his word. Why would we ever think that we will know how to live this life if we don't consult the one that created it? He gives instructions on how to live this life through his word. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. Paul says this to Timothy. From childhood, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and listen to this, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We find wisdom in his word. It shows us the path of righteousness for all areas of life. It equips us for everything we will ever face and prepares us for the good works he already has planned for us. Third, we must ask for wisdom. James, the half-brother of Jesus, he says this in James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Asking God for his wisdom. You ready for this? Asking God for his wisdom is an act of surrender to who he is and to his eternal purposes. And don't just ask wisdom for yourself. Ask for wisdom to be given to others. Listen to Paul in Colossians 1.9. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and all spiritual, spiritual understanding. Pray for God's wisdom in your life and the life of others. Ask him for wisdom. He will give you all the wisdom you need for the season of life that you are in right now. Fourth and finally, we must learn to trust him completely. Oh, this is hard, 
And this is a hard one. And we all fell at it at some point. We can say we trust him. But does the way we live, live every part of our life say we completely trust him? No. And that is the good news. What? Yes, that is the good news. You see, the Christian walk is not about perfection. It's about progress. That's why I said we must learn to trust him. We must learn to believe that everything that comes our way is allowed or decreed by a good and loving God who knows all things and is using his unlimited power to bring about the best outcomes by the best possible means for the greatest amount of people for the longest possible time for his glory and for our good. So let me ask you today, is there something in your life that is stressing you out and you just don't understand what is going on? Maybe a relationship or something at work or at school. Maybe a loved one or a family member. Maybe it, it may be sickness, a health issue, or a loss of a loved one. Maybe you're going through a financial hardship right now. Whatever it may be, wouldn't it be nice to have someone that could give you the perfect advice, give the perfect advice to you for the situation you are in right now? Someone that wants to produce the best possible results through the best possible means. Someone that is working all things out for the good of those that love him. There is someone just waiting to share his wisdom and advice with you. How would it make you feel to know that the, God, that the good God that is control of his creation is just waiting to share his wisdom on the situation you are going through right now? My suggestion is this. Go to him. Let him know your thoughts and feelings. Let him know your questions. Let him know your fears. And listen to this. Let him know even your doubts. The all-knowing and all-wise God is not surprised about your thoughts. He already knows. There is not a question or doubt that will catch him off guard. There's not a question or doubt that he cannot answer. I encourage you today. I encourage you to find rest and peace in his wisdom today. Seek his wisdom in his word and ask for his wisdom. The promise, he will grant you all the wisdom you need as he leads and guides you along the path of righteousness. Rest in his wisdom today. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. You don't know have to worry about where this is going and where this is going. Find rest and peace that the God of the universe wants to, one, share his wisdom with you, two, that he already knows what's going to happen and he's already got what's best planned for you tomorrow. Father, we love you and we thank you. And we just ask for your leadership and your guidance. We ask that you share your wisdom with us in the situation that we're in. Give us the wisdom we need to continue walking forward and sharing your name and your glory so all the world can see how great of a God that you are. We love you and we thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me this week. I encourage you to come back next week and join us next week as we talk about the justice of God. Have a great week.